In this edition of Life Stories, we meet a truly inspirational woman who over seven years of her childhood witnessed the very worst kind of cruelty and misery imaginable. In fact, as Mindu Hornick says, there are no words to describe Auschwitz. Today, Mindu is the only survivor of Auschwitz that lives in the Netherlands. Mindu's story is powerful, harrowing and almost unbelievable, but it's a story that has to be told. Well, thank you very much, Mindu, for coming into uh, the studio to tell us all about your incredible story. Um, I think it's worth saying just to start off with that we did first meet socially some 30 years ago, and at that point, yes. I didn't know that no. you were a survivor of the Holocaust. Yeah. But I, I was told a few years later, but it yes. was then another few years when you were somehow prompted to, to start telling your story to in schools. To start talking about it, yes. What was the defining moment that, uh, that made you decide that? Um, well, we realised that um, the, it is important to tell our story, uh, that hopefully it will never happen again. It was uh, absolute paramount that we start telling. And then um, education group started forming from the Association of Jewish Refugees. Uh, and they gave lessons to people to talk because a lot of people couldn't talk about it. Uh, it was too painful for us to share our stories. So for all those years after you were liberated, yeah. you, 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 you we, just we, tightened yeah, up? just tightened up and we didn't talk about it, no. no. Well, more about that later, but let's go back to 1929, when you were born in what was then called Czechoslovakia. Slovakia, yes. That's right. Um, your earliest memories, tell us about your earliest memories. Well, um, we had a lovely home, what I can remember. We were a family of four, two, two young brothers and an older sister. And we had, uh, it was a rural part of Slovakia. We had a lovely home with an orchard. And we had good rela relations with our neighbors, our Slovak neighbors, and with our school friends. But unfortunately, um, once the Germans started persecuting the Jews, it all changed. But before, before you know, we that, talk about the German yeah, yeah. Um, and the, before the Nazis, that, yes. Your childhood as a toddler and, and yeah. as, a, as a young girl, I mean, presumably you played in the orchard, you played games. We, we played in the fun. orchard, we played games. We, I remember us having, um, uh, what they call it, at the end of the season, we had the bonfires, mm -hmm. baking potatoes in it, making gems and copper kettles outside with the whole neighborhood. And um, we, we, we were, a religious family, Jew the family life meant a lot. Like the festivals were always well observed. And um, we had a, a small synagogue, which we used because we were a small community, but surrounding areas would come and join our synagogue. So we're, we're in the, the uh, it was a, It was a lovely life. It so was a lovely it life in, say, the mid-30s. Yes, in the mid-30s, a lovely life. And we went to school. And presumably families, whether it be Jewish or uh, other faiths, they, they knew each other and we, they were friends. We knew each other and it made no difference. We were on good relations with all our okay. friends. So the 30s is moving on. Yes. As a child, I was trying to, to, to think about this before yep. we came in today, is that there was no internet in those days, obviously. There was no television. No. Um, probably no. limited radio, or radio was playing music. Yeah, very, may, just were mainly you, music. Were yeah. you aware as a child that the winds of change were coming in all over Not Europe? Not really. No. Not really. Not really till about 1941. Uh, 1940, when we heard that our family in Prague were taken to a transit camp in um, Theresienstadt, where all the Czech Jews went. But um, we, we could feel tension. We as children weren't told anything. We w everything was kept secret from us. And as we have established, we didn't have internet, we didn't have any 
television, so we weren't very well informed, no. And your parents behaved normally? They, they behaved normally till mm. my father was recruited to the so-called army. Well, but why do you say so-called army? Because these men weren't given uniforms. They had a normal suit, which just the style of David. And they were sent ahead of the German uh, armadas to dig their trenches, unload their lorries, to do all their menial tasks. And that's where really we started feeling the terrible stress. All my father's business was confiscated. What business was he? Uh, he was a wood and hay merchant. Uh, they were the woods there that were being used all over the world for furniture. And in those days, <laughs> there was no animal food. Uh, the hay was being cut at when it was green and fresh and cut, put into bales. And there was special factory, uh, special works to tie these bales and they were sending them, selling them to the um, farmers. So uh, I mean, I'm just yeah. Yeah. picking up this yes. picture of almost yeah. an idyllic life in the mid-30s. It I mean, is you already absolutely mentioned that absolutely idyllic. That, yes, that yes. Hitler's doing his deals in different yes, parts of yes. Central Europe yes. and your father is called up into the army but it's menial it's work, he's not really a soldier. It's, it's not a soldier, it's, it's the one getting a Free labour. Free labour, yes. Yeah. Because the Germans always got the underdog to do the menial tasks, they didn't do it. The next thing is there's a knock on the door and it's yes. off to the ghetto. Yes, to the ghetto. Well, um, our town, the small community there was about 35 families, were, was cleared out, including my grandparents, some other relations and neighbors, Jewish neighbors, except for about 10 or 12 of the families that the husbands were in the military, what I was telling you, so-called army. Uh, for some reason, the Hungarian president who collaborated with the Germans insisted that these families are being left at home. But it was very hard for my mother. We had no money coming in. I mean, how she managed to feed four of us, I don't really, I can't imagine. But she must have been very resourceful, which I know she was. So you go to this nearby town, yes. you're in a ghetto. Just briefly tell us about your daily routine. I mean, did you still go to school? Uh, we still went to school. Um, <laughs> we... <laughs> They gave that part of Slovakia to the Hungarians. I told you this Hungarian president insisted that these families would stay at home. Um, they imported Hungarian teachers, and we went to Hungarian school. The Slovaks could please themselves, but we as Jewish children were to please the authorities. Oh. We immediately went to Hungarian school. So for my sins, I still speak Hungarian. <laughs> So the ghetto. Yeah. The next horrible uh, incident uh, yes. is the yes. being marched to a train, cattle trucks, and an horrendous journey yes. to a destination you didn't know the destination. First of all, we were taken into the town centre, taken onto lorries, and taken to a ghetto. That for six or eight weeks we were there. They would section off a part of the city. Again, it was very rural. If I remember correctly, we lived on a hayloft. There was my mother with a little bit of food she bought with my little brothers. And there were lots of other families there. We lived in a hayloft. And we were there for about six weeks. And then suddenly, again, we were rounded up like cattle, taken onto railway sidings and put into cattle wagons. And I know because you, you, you've yes, told me yes, on a previous yes, occasion yes. that you spent three incredibly horrible, miserable, cold nights, days and nights, days and traveling nights, to yeah, this yes, yes. unknown destination. Quite. And then you open, and then, then the cattle truck is open, the doors to the cattle truck are yes. open. And, and did you know you were in Auschwitz? No. We had no idea where we were being taken. We had nothing. I mean, once, to describe to you a little bit of the horror, once we were taken into these carriages, 
uh, we were left in darkness and we hadn't got a clue where we were going. What we'll do, yeah, because this is the next yes, part of this, this incredible story. Uh -huh. We'll take a break now yeah, and we'll come back yes. and we'll look at the next part yes, of okay. your okay. journey and life story. Yes, okay. On Life Stories Today, we're talking to Mindu Hornick, the only known Holocaust survivor living in the Midlands. So when the cattle truck doors opened, yeah. there was a defining moment, wasn't there? That was a defining moment. Well, there was panic. There was um, shock and panic. And there were the SS men walking around, barking dogs viciously and um, loudspeakers, whether it was disorientators, I don't know. But on this cattle truck, when it opened, one of these capos, which were in striped clothing, a Polish man jumped onto the carriage. And as we were by the door, I told you, he said to my mother in Yiddish, which are your children? My mother said, well, these are my girls and these are my two little boys. He said, why don't you let you, these girls go ahead? Let them go ahead. You will see them later. The fact, I think, that he spoke to her in a language, in a Yiddish language, um, she thought it was the right thing to do. You can imagine the confusion and the panic. So she turned to us and she said to us, do as this man says. Go ahead, I'll see you later. From then on, we were separate from our mother and our children, which we didn't know, our little brothers, which we didn't know at the time. Anyway, as he was helping us down, because these carriages were very high to scramble down the carriage, he said to me, you say you're 17, and you, to my sister, you say you're 19. And you were 13 at this point. Yes, right? yes. It's 1942, you're yes, 13. Yes, I was 13. But he said, tell them you are 17. Your sister, she said she was two years older. You are 19. And du bist a Schneiderin means you are a seamstress. And go, go, go ahead. And he really urged us. So we joined this enormous trail of people. And we got to the top of that queue. We realized uh, we reached the famous gate, Arbeit macht frei, work makes you free. There was a selection. There were. Uh, now, is uh, that in your memory? You saw that? Yeah, we saw sign, that and Arbeit we saw this. Frei, yeah. this um, we saw this gate and there was selection. Mothers and children were pushed to the left and older people. The most of the train consisted of just mothers and children. They collected the dregs of that area. And then um, we were guided through, we were allowed into the main camp. I, in all honesty, Mike, I cannot remember if we were asked our age, but later on, they had 90% of records. The records were there, because years later we were entitled to a pension, and I couldn't remember anything. And they said, we, we, don't worry. The solicitors came back within six weeks. He said, we've got all your records. But I cannot remember them asking. You can imagine the shock and the disorientation. You didn't know what, where you, you were. Just a, yeah, uh, a, a kid. Child, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. You? yeah. So uh, once we went through this famous gate, I mean, the sight, well, I'll never forget it. It'll stay with me for the rest of life. Mm. Okay. Yeah. There were corpses everywhere. Corpses mm -hmm. everywhere. There was this terrible smell and grey ash all around. There were watchtowers with um, 
soldiers pointing machine guns at us. And they were yelling at us to form into fives to march. They were obsessed with people standing in two or five and marching. And what did we know about marching? Were you able to stay with your sister at this uh, point? Oh, we were able to stay with my sister, e yes. Eva? Yeah, Eva. Oh, yes. We held on to each other tight yes. and we, we stayed. A lot of people survived the camp. They lived for each other in pairs because people lived for each mm -hmm. other. Anyway, so um, into rows of five and the minute they got us together, they started marching us. And we, they marched us to the shower rooms to be deloused. Took our, we had to s be stripped naked, our hair shaven. They, there were men around with rough scissors just cutting our hairs off. And then when we'd finished, they threw us uh, just uh, uh, one of these striped uh, uh, and some wooden clogs. They brought all of Holland, of, uh, from Holland, all these wooden clogs. This is all on the same night? On the same day. And then we were taken what is called a block where we would be housed, which usually held 1,000 people. And there were bunk beds of three tiers in each square, which was only a little bit bigger than this, would hold eight people. Uh, but that night, by the time we arrived, it was night. The they were all occupied, the beds. There was no room for us to go on one of these bunks. So we had to sit up on the stone floor all night without any water. What to month was it? Was it cold? Or um, no, it was June. Oh, so uh, it, it, was wasn't yeah, it wasn't too bad. Uh, we had no water to drink or to wash, no sanitation, and uh, people were dying. Uh, uh, typhoid was rampant. It was everywhere. Tell us, I Mindu, mean, about a day, a normal day. Just you get up, was there any food in the morning? No, no, there wasn't. They would give us um, a cup of soup at lunchtime, which was made of turnips, uh, tasteless. It was slimy, tasteless soup. Um, like in one dish, like a trough, and you would all have several had to mm -hmm. drink out of that. But that soup was also laced with some kind of uh, chemical, I think bromide, to dull our senses and to, the senses, yeah. and yeah. to stop all women's bodily functions. Right. Yeah. I know that you spent time in Auschwitz and then you were moved to a, a slave labor camp. Yes, we were selected to a slave labor camp. And, and that, wasn't, that was slightly different. Slightly better because they needed us for work. I mean, once you were chosen out of the death camp Auschwitz with the crematoriums around you, you possibly had a chance of survival, particularly if you were working. So 500 women, again, we were taken to a big hall, 10 times the size of this, um, stripped naked again. I mean, at any time, the humiliation, mm. the we were making bombs and grenades. It was a factory outside. I must tell you, this factory was incredible. It was outside Bremen, underground, in a wood. So the Allies were looking because they knew the ammunition coming out, but they couldn't find us. Um, then suddenly, May, late May, they put us on a passenger train, the first time on a passenger train. But either side of the train, they still put up mm machine guns. Tell us about, briefly, about the liberation. Yeah. Well, the liberation, we were, after our train was bombed by the Allies, not knowing that there were concentration camps, we were walked to the port of Lübeck. And um, they set us on a hill, still wanted to load us on a truck, sending us um, to hand us over to the Red Cross. But were by some miracle, we decided we couldn't move. We had sick and wounded girls. And uh, suddenly dusk fell and our Lagerführer came, the head of our camp, and he said, um, you are going to be free and we are going to go into captivity. And we sat there 
terrified we were in hostile areas. And only two days later did we see a tank and a couple of outriders and a jeep going by, and they were the Americans because they were deep in US Germany. Army. The US Army who liberated us. And they were fantastic. They set up a school. Uh, they took over a school and set up um, uh, a medical unit for all the sick and wounded girls. And we, um, they started looking after us. And after uh, a month or so, they took us to the, uh, to the Baltic Sea to recuperate because we were very weak and very hungry and very, and a lot of wounded girls from the train bombing. Mindu, what a powerful, powerful story. And as we said at the beginning, it's a story that, that has to be told. So you talked us through your childhood, the ghetto, Auschwitz, the labor camp, and then I know that you recuperated by the Baltic, you went to Prague, you came to England, you met your future husband and you have two fine daughters. And um, so yeah. there was time then to, to heal um, to, as much as you can. Have you got a final message you'd like to Yes, tell us? I have. We hope that our existence despite our history, proves the failure of attempts to eradicate our people. And that we can both contribute to making the world a better place in which our descendants can live happily.